Okay, thank you. Thank you, Francesco. And uh, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, we're starting uh, another breakout session here um, uh, at New Directions 2021. And uh, this session is called New Perspectives on Online Vocabulary Testing. Do cheats really never prosper? So we're joined today by um, three, th three, three guys from Japan in the same, in the same uh, country as myself. So we're happy with the Japan team here. Uh, let me introduce and let me introduce them. Uh, we've got Paul Matheson, who's an associate professor in the Cl Department of Clinical English at Nara Medical University. Uh, Paul teaches medical and nursing students at NMU and is the coordinator of the nursing English program there. Uh, we also have Francesco Bolstad, who is also uh, at the uh, Department of Clinical English at Nara Medical University. Uh, he coordinates a range of cl clinical English courses and a diverse team of teachers dedicated to a collaborative teaching approach. And finally, uh, Claire, Claire Murray, also of, of Nara Medical University. Uh, she holds an MA in Applied Linguistics from the University of Birmingham, and she has taught ESL, EFL to a wide range of students in New Zealand and Japan. And is currently an ESP lecturer in the Department of Clinical English at Nara Medical University. So before I hand over to them, I'd just like to remind everyone that please, uh, we're gonna have a short time for Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to post them in the chat and we can uh, address those at the end. Uh, but without further ado, let me hand over to Paul to begin. That's right. Yeah. Great. Thank, yeah. thank you so much Paul. for the wonderful right. introduction, Neil. Um, I guess, Francesco, are you going to share your screen now? We can bring awesome. that up. Thank you. Um, so uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world joining us. Um, my name is Paul Matheson, uh, and I'm joined by my co-presenters and colleagues uh, at Nara Medical University, Claire Murray and Francesca Bolstad. And the three of us are going to discuss uh, some research that we've been involved in looking at the nature and extent of cheating and online vocabulary testing at our institution. Uh, and answer, hopefully answer the question, do cheats actually never prosper, fulfilling the, um, the old proverb there. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the, the data we've collected and look at some of the changes that we've made and are proposing to make um, as a result of our findings. So next slide, please, Francesco. Uh, so to start with, uh, I'm going to look at um, what we mean by cheating um, and give some context to that. Uh, I'm then going to hand over to Claire, who's going to talk in more detail about the, the learning and teaching context in which the vocabulary testing regime occurs. Uh, then I'll come back and give some of the findings. We'll talk about some of the findings we, we have in relation to um, how our students cheated, to what extent they cheated, and also get some um, views on their perceptions of the testing and also the cheating that went on. And then finally, Francesco is going to talk about what, we, what we've changed as a result uh, up to this point and also uh, some proposed future changes based on our findings. Next slide, please, Francesco. So uh, I think for morally upright, upstanding people like the three of us, and I'm sure most of the attendees at this conference, um, I think it's very easy to, to say, well, I would never cheat. I'm a good, honest person. I always do right. And Dan Ariely, who is a, uh, a world-renowned psychologist, behavioral economist, who has spent a lot of time researching human dishonesty and cheating, um, points out that, in fact, um, the reality is that cheating is fairly ubiquitous uh, across cultures, across countries, across time. And that, in fact, people are quite good at justifying, self-justifying their cheating behaviors uh, in order to make themselves feel good. And so from our point of view, the question about why do people cheat is not so much a moralistic question. It's more of a, what are the circumstances that enable people to cheat and how can we react to those circumstances? So next slide, please, Francesco. 
So why do people cheat? Well, I think the truth is there are lots of reasons. Um, but one of the clear findings from, um, from social science is that in situations where there are high stakes, uh, there is often a high probability of cheating, where there are dramatic or serious consequences, important consequences that rest on a particular action, um, it's quite likely that people will take advantage of a cheating uh, opportunity. So we've seen this throughout history, uh, around 2000 years ago when Chinese would-be civil servants were taking their civil service e entrance exams, despite the fact that cheating on those tests carried with it a death penalty for not only the student, but also the teacher, uh, there were reports that students were willing to take that chance. Uh, I guess the stakes were high enough for them that uh, getting the job was so important that they may, may have been willing to take that really, really serious risk. Uh, in the world of academia, we've seen lots of instances of this. I'm sure many of you, most of you are familiar with the Haruko Obokata um, case, the Stap Seibel case from about seven years ago. We may never know why um, Ms. Obokata faked her data, um, but I suspect that part of the reason was due to the publish or perish pressure that a lot of academics face, very high stakes. I mentioned Dana Reilly before, an expert in uh, human behavioral economics and particularly in cheating and dishonest behaviors. Uh, strangely enough, this year, um, researchers found that a study that he had been involved in was incontrovertibly based upon fraudulent data. So even people who research cheating, it seems, are susceptible to cheating behaviors. Next slide, please, Francesco. So what is cheating? Well. I think there are a lot of definitions and for our purposes, um, what we're concerned with is uh, test focused and language learning um, focused aspects of cheating, um, but it's still problematic to define it. There are a lot of cultural aspects. Um, so for example, plagiarism uh, in a lot of Eastern contexts, uh, copying the work of venerated authors, authorities um, such as Confucius or other philosophers, without attributing those quotes is seen as good academia, good work. Whereas in a lot of other countries, particularly in the West, that would be regarded as a clear instance of plagiarism. Um, here in Japan, um, for a long time, mathematics teachers discouraged students from using calculators. They considered that a form of cheating. Students were encouraged to do calculations in their head. Whereas I think in most Western countries, calculators are simply seen as a tool for students to use, not cheating at all. Other problems with getting a handle on cheating relate to institutional variation. I think within cultures, within countries, there are different views of cheating, depending, for example, on the discipline or the, the field. But even within institutions themselves, you sometimes get different departments having different views about what is and what isn't cheating. And of course, there have been a lot of digital advances in the last 20, 30 years, and keeping up with those has meant we had to keep revisiting the concept of cheating. And I think machine trans translation continues to be an area where this is a bit problematic. Next slide, please, Francesco. So for our purposes, um, we've followed the definition from uh, Ms. Correa, who she's uh, an ESL teacher, and she surveyed uh, a lot of uh, uh, different work looking at uh, how to define academic dishonesty. And specifically for the ESL context, we focused on these two aspects for our testing, uh, intentional use of unauthorized materials in an academic exercise, taking a test, vocabulary test, and facilitating academic dishonesty by helping others. So that's it for me for now. Claire, I'm gonna hand over to you. Great. Um, next slide, please, Francesco. Thanks, Paul. Um, now I'm going to quickly give you an overview of our students at Nara Medical University, their study situation, and some background information about the vocabulary tests that our study is based on. Our students in the study are first year medical students at a public medical university in Japan. As part of their curriculum, um, they study two 90 minute English classes um, a week for 15 weeks. In class, we um, adopt a CLIL approach and cover a variety of social science and medical topics, such as motivation, human happiness, neuroplasticity, so on. Um, we don't study vocabulary in class. Students um, are responsible to study English vocabulary, vocabulary on their own outside of class time. Next slide, please. Oh, next. Overall, um, our first year students have a good handle 
on the 2000 most common English words, but um, after 2000 words, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, next slide, please. The vocabulary our students have to study is the academic word list compiled by Avril Coxhead. The AWL is the 570 most frequently used English academic words. These 570 words are broken down into 10 sub lists based on frequency, and our students study and are tested on one sub list a week for 10 weeks. Um, these AWL tests contain um, 10 questions, 10 target words taken from the sub list of that week at random. And at the end of the semester, there's a final review test um, students have to pass, which have one question, one target word from each sub list. Uh, next slide, please. So in April 2020, we, as much of the world, um, Nara Medical University, we suddenly went online and we adopted the emergency remote teaching format. We had less than a week to convert our curriculum and assessments to an online format. So in kind of desperation, we attempted to copy our in-person style of teaching and assessment. Um, we used Zoom for our classes and Edmodo um, for our assessment and student communication. From June 2020, we started a hybrid teaching format. We had some online classes and some face-to-face -face classes. Next slide, please. Now, Paul mentioned that uh, high stakes situations can promote uh, cheating behavior. And for our students, uh, these AWL tests are quite high stakes. Um, these 10 weekly tests are part of their final grade. The passing grade for these tests is eight out of 10, which is quite high. For the final review test, students need to pass at least two face-to-face um, in-person -face in tests as a, a condition of passing the entire English course. If they fail any course, um, including English, uh, they must repeat a full academic year, all subjects. So quite high stakes indeed. That's a lot of pressure. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at these tests. Um, in our face-to-face -face style, the AWL test is 10 words. Um, from that week's sublist, the students must write a full grammatically correct sentence using the word. Um, they had 10 minutes and of course they were supervised because it was in class. Uh, next slide, please. The online test tried to copy that face-to-face -face, uh, format. So we used Edmodo, they still had the 10 words, they still had to write um, a full grammatically correct sentence. Um, they had, however, 15 minutes, and this is to take into account any internet problems, any connectivity problem, any Enmodo problems. Also, um, the fact that our students weren't very good at typing, um, they couldn't type very quickly. Of course, they were taking these tests at home and they were unsupervised. Next slide, please. So in our study, uh, we looked at the sources of the final review, sorry, the scores of the final review tests of students from um, the academic year 2018 and the students from the academic year 2020. These were all face-to-face -face tests, these final review scores, but only the 2020 cohort had, um, online, had taken online tests. Um, and we also look at the results of the 108 first year student, student surveys about their cheating behavior. These questionnaires were given anonymously. Um, they were given to the students during class time and they were non-compulsory. Uh, and now I'm going to pass back to Paul to explain the results of these tests. Uh, thanks. thanks, Claire. So as Claire mentioned, um, there were two aspects to our data collection, one quantitative, uh, which was test data and one which was qualitative student questionnaires. I'm going to start by looking at the um, the performances of the two groups uh, in the final, the first of the final face-to-face -face review tests. Um, one of the reasons why we chose the 2018 group to compare against was we had a ready data set uh, which enabled us to do that. We'd done a previous study, which I've put here at the bottom, uh, which looked at the effect of uh, introducing humour um, on uh, students' ability to learn uh, academic vocabulary. Um, so we had that data set. And before we before we went about uh, analyzing the data, we we were expecting that the students in the group last year were going to perform more poorly than the group in 2018, uh, simply because um, they had uh, they had less time and fewer opportunities to take face-to-face -face 
academic word lists, tests, and they also had more materials to learning materials, resources. So we were pleasantly surprised to find that the 2020 group uh, did better than the 2018 group, uh, not to a degree of statistical significance, but nevertheless, and that's perhaps not surprising given that the scores were from one to 10. So there was not a, a huge range of possible scores and maybe other reasons too. But nevertheless, we were surprised that the 2020 group did better than the 2018 group. Next slide, please, Francesco. So why was that? Um, why did the 2020 group outperform the 2018 group? Well, we think there are a number of reasons why. One might be the, the shock factor. Um, as Claire said, halfway through the semester last year, the students having spent the first half of the semester only doing online AWL tests, suddenly were introduced to face-to-face -face, uh, AWL tests. And, and we, we wondered, and in fact, some students actually commented on this in their feedback to us, that the face-to-face -face tests were a lot harder. Um, there was no room for cheating because they were supervised and they had to do a lot more preparation for those. So that may have uh, given the, 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 uh, the figurative kick up the bum to the students to actually get studying and, and do the work, which enabled them to get to perform better on the final test. There also may have been a question of the, the increased um, exposure to academic word lists and, and maybe more varied exposure. Um, in previous years, students, as I said, had a lot of resources available to them, particularly from their seniors, their senior students who had pre prepared, for example, uh, example sentence lists for the academic word lists. So our students last year didn't have access to a lot of those resources and had to presumably create their own resources. And that may have uh, given them some greater depth of knowledge of academic word list items. Next slide, please, Francesco. So in terms of the feedback we got from our students, um, the first batch of questions I'm gonna look at here. Um, firstly, if you look at item one, so um, I mentioned the previous research we did looking at um, the use of humor and its impact on academic vocabulary learning. Um, because of a, as Claire said, we were in a rush to get this, this um, course online. Um, there was a, an oversight and in fact the lists of funny sentences only got distributed to one class that's why one reason why the the numbers are so low on that uh questionnaire item but i think also one of the interesting things from this first lot of questions is that you'll notice that there are a lot of students who indicated that they cheated sometimes in some of these ways but relatively few who admitted to cheating mostly on the test or all the time on the tests in these ways next uh, slide please francesco um, another finding which we thought was interesting, if you look at uh, item seven, um, previous research on ESL and EFL learners taking online tests found that copying and pasting was in some cases rife. Um, and we expected that to be the same in our situation, but it, it turns out it wasn't, as long as the students were being honest, which we assume that they were. Um, very few admitted to directly copying and pasting from the internet, which uh, was mildly surprising. Next slide, please, Francesco. So some of the talking points from, from that questionnaire data. Um, so the majority of our students didn't cheat for most of the tests. That much was clear. Um, a lot of the students did cheat, but most of them didn't cheat for most or all of the tests. There are also relatively few instances of what you might call more serious cheating. Um, copying and pasting I've already talked about. Um, checking answers with classmates during class or with other people, um, or worse still taking the test on behalf of someone else. Uh, these just weren't uh, in evidence in our, um, in our course. Next slide, please, Francesco. Some of the bad things. Um, so I, I've mentioned that a lot of students admitted to cheating sometimes. In fact, the majority said that they had used their own sentence lists or consulted dictionaries during online tests. And perhaps worse still, um, a lot of our students admitted to doing little or no study at all for the online tests, um, which created a bit of a problem. Next slide, please, Francesco. Um, we also got some uh, some comments and feedback from our students in the questionnaire. Um, a lot of the comments focused on technical issues, as Claire touched on before. Um, student, many students had difficulty uh, inputting answers for tests on smartphones or tablets or computers rather than writing. For a lot of our students, that was their first uh, first time doing so in this course. Um, also, perhaps understandably, we had a lot of system problems um, with not only with Edmodo and, and our online learning platform, but also with 
devices too. Um, this caused a lot of problems for students. Next slide, please, Francesco. Um, I mentioned about the, the shock factor of going back face to face. Um, a lot of the students found it difficult as this quote uh, attests because they weren't able to cheat. Um, there were teachers monitoring their, their work and they had to study to prepare for those tests and pass them. Next slide, please, Francesco. Uh, in terms of the efficacy of online, we had a lot of students, again, quite understandably, I think, questioning the value and the validity of our online tests. In a situation where they know that a lot of their classmates are cheating, a lot of students asked, why are we doing these online tests if everyone can cheat? Doesn't have any meaning. Um, next slide, please, Francesco. And finally, um, we did have a few students who said they never cheated. Um, and this was a fairly representative quote for some of those students to say, well, it was great when we went back to face-to-face -face hard tests because people like me who didn't cheat were rewarded for our hard work. So uh, with all the cheating that was going on, there were still some who remained truthful, remained honest and uh, did the work. Over to you, Francesco. Thank you, Paul. So um, I'm just going to speak quickly to uh, what was going on in the background and what changes we made and are making and will make in the future to our own program uh, based on our experience and, and our research. And I hope that that will uh, put it in context and may be useful to some of you. So while I talk about what we actually did, please keep in mind that um, emergency remote teaching for us equaled going online in five days. We were told on a Thursday that we were going online. Classes started the next Wednesday. Um, we came in on a uh, Saturday to have a team meeting, and this is what we, we came up with. Um, so we, we had to do something to take our, our tests online um, because they're in the syllabus and um, we, we need to change it in some way. We gave students an extra 15 minutes, as Claire talked about, um, and that was based on what turned out to be a mistaken um, kind of idea uh, that students would need more time. We we ended up taking away that 15 minutes <laughs> down to 10 as our first change um, in order to uh, try and stop students cheating. Um, and that was based on our theory of how they were cheating. But uh, later research showed us that this was different and we've made different changes since then. Um, so we next uh, switched to a fully uh, multiple choice format for online testing. And uh, we continued the productive tests, sentence writing type vocabulary tests uh, for face-to-face -face, uh, tests. Um, and students were given the original 10 minutes. Here we go. Uh, the move, uh, from then on was was to adjust the details. So we, we went from a 10 minute for our, our multiple choice test to a five minute. And unlike our first reduction in time, this does, based on student feedback and, and teachers uh, looking at the test, this does have, seem to have had some effect um, in lowering students' teaching, uh, cheating. And uh, some teachers came up with other ways to uh, try and reduce student cheating by uh, using screenshot uh, images of the uh, target sentences. Uh, this means that students can't copy and paste and use those in other ways. Also, this seems to have had some effect within the um, environment of gone, going to multiple choice tests. So uh, moving forwards, what have we learned and what changes will we make? Uh, well, we still believe that regular testing is important um, and we don't want to do away with our regular tests uh, entirely. But we do feel that um, on, even if we go back face to face, we will stick with online self-marking multiple choice tests for our regular tests. This is useful for the teachers and uh, we think it's good for the students. So also we think that some formats of tests lend themselves to cheating more than others. And multiple choice tests seem to have reduced cheating in our institute, even though they're unsupervised. We feel that 
um, given both the opportunity and enough incentive, there are a significant number of students who do cheat according to our data. And so going forwards, we will actually move to, as we can't reduce the opportunity, we will actually move to reduce the incentive by making these tests less high stakes for our regular tests and keeping the high stakes side of testing to our face-to-face -face tests. Uh, so that's all from me. Uh, here are some references and hopefully we can get the slides out to you so that you can use those in the future. Um, and if you want to get in contact with us or visit our homepage for our department, uh, there are the details there for you. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. There were a few questions, I think, in the chat. Neil, uh, I don't know if you were monitoring the questions or... Yes, yeah, I just put them in the in the chat there for you. Do you if you want to yeah. address them yourselves, or I uh, think so I will stop. I will stop sharing. Uh, so anybody who wants to take a, an image of this, please do. I'm, I'd like to hear Francesco's uh, answer for um, yes. I think Francesco is the best place. One. Carolyn's question about gr grammar, grammatical components. Grammatically correct sentence. Why is there a requirement to re write a grammatically correct sentence if they're being tested on the AWL vocabulary? Uh, well, the, the truth to that is that there, there are two things that we are, are trying to get out of these tests. We do not focus on grammar throughout the rest of the course. We run a CLIL uh, program and communication is very much our target. So this is one of the few places in the course that grammar is required, and it's required in distinct sentences. The, the next point there is that uh, vocabulary always needs to be used within uh, a, a communicative uh, format, and uh, some of some grammar mistakes actually reduce or don't or show that students have not learned the vocabulary item in a way where they could use it in the future. This is an area where we have a lot of debate uh, between the teachers and the level at which we should test grammar, uh, people have different opinions about. But taking away all grammar would mean that it wasn't a sentence. So um, we're talking about uh, some good uh, point at which, at, at which we can still test or encourage students to study the vocabulary productively. So that's a bit of a long answer to that, but but the short and simple of it is, um, yes, there's debate about that. Uh, we can't do away with it entirely, and we are quite strict on it. I think just to add to that too, um, I think separating grammar from vocabulary is really difficult, and absolutely a part of knowing a word is knowing the grammar that is connected with the use of that word. And so, as Francesco said, like where you draw that line is debatable right and we've had ongoing discussions with the staff and the students too about where that line should be should be drawn but it's it's really hard to remove the two or separate the two completely and absolutely grammatical knowledge of how to use a word is is important we believe um, if student I think, used a verb as a noun obviously that would be exactly a, yeah. a verb that couldn't be used as a noun that would be and a, a very common a very common problem we see too is students, you know, not knowing how the the part of speech that words are used in, um, not knowing the grammar of associated with that word, that it's not a word that's used as a verb or not a word that's used as an adjective. Um, uh, Carolyn had another question, which yeah. was about um, whether students are penalised for uh, learning sentences off by heart or regurgitating sentences that they had learned. Um, not as such, Carolyn, um, but th this is sort of touching it, maybe one of the problems that we're trying to address too, which is that um, we found that students, what students tend to do, or a lot of students tend to do is memorize sentences. And that's sentences, really not what we like want them to do. We, we, we want, yeah, memorize, wrote, memorize sentences, um, which therefore, if they do that, if that's all that they do, um, you could argue that they don't really know how to use the word. Like, give me a definite, what does, um, what does relevant mean? And well, I can write a sentence that shows the use of relevant, but I can't explain to you what the word relevant means. And this is a, an ongoing problem as well. And I think a lot of the teachers are trying to, in Francesco in particular, are trying to reinforce to the students that what they really need to do is learn the meaning of the word first um, and foremost. And then 
move on to other ways of approaching the test, such as, you know, writing sentences, creating sentence lists, and so on. I don't know if that answers your question, Carolyn, but. So they're not penalized if they can write the, no. the question, uh, they can write the sentence correctly. And there is, there is one more uh, question. Are they exposed to the AWL? So I can maybe answer that. Uh, yeah. the, the, the curriculum is a CLIL curriculum. We, we use things like neurogenesis articles uh, rather than papers usually because uh, they are more at the student's level. And if you have a look at the AWL and the research on it, you'll see that uh, newspaper articles or, or the like have a high percentage of the AWL. And we find that the articles that we are using also have a high percentage of the AWL items. They're not coordinated in that sense. Ah, thank you, yes. So, so they're not specifically, uh, the articles aren't uh, coordinated with what AWL items that they're learning on that week. Oh, nice. Great. Okay, guys, I think we're gonna have to wrap things up here, but thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation and uh, uh, sharing your study findings with, with us. Um, looks like uh, generated some interest in the in the chat box there, and um, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you guys, and I hope you uh, uh, stay safe down there in West Japan, from over here cool. in East East Japan. Um, and before I close, I'd just like to remind everyone we do have a community and discussion rooms. So if you go to the top of the off the top of the platform, there's a little menu there. You can go over there and see if there's anybody about who would like to discuss this topic with uh, further uh, with you with you in the rooms there and also that our um, climate action in language assessment panel is starting shortly so you'll find that uh, link to that uh, session uh, in the platform appearing appearing now I believe uh, so yeah just less less to say thank you very much guys and uh, enjoy enjoy the rest of your weekend thank, thank you, you very much Neil. Neil. And uh, anybody who wants to contact us, please do. We're always interested in collaborating with people. And uh, Paul is the main front person for our vocabulary research at the moment. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks, guys.